to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ we do not sorrow as others who have no hope. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse number 13. We welcome you today to our study of the books of 1 and 2 Thessalonians as we think about the wonderful subject of the second coming of Christ. Friend, one of the things that Christians can be encouraged by is if we live faithful to God, there is a day coming when the Lord will gather His own and He will take them back to live with God forever. And what an encouragement that is for Christians. And so we're so glad that you joined us for our study today. We hope that you'll have your Bible handy and out as we're going to be looking to the Word of God to study this beautiful subject. And friend, we want you to know that this lesson is being brought to you by individual congregations and members of the Church of Christ. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit them. If you've got a Bible question, you'd like to learn more about the church or the plan of salvation or, or what, how they worship God, friend, won't you stop by and visit them? They'd be happy to discuss that with you. And here at the Gospel of Christ, we also want you to know that we want to help you in any way we can in your study of the Word of God. Visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a large variety of video and audio lessons on nearly every topic in every book of the Bible. Study questions, transcripts, just a good host of Bible study material available free of charge from our website. Also, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, it's free of charge as well, available for download on our website, or if you need a DVD or a CD, we'd be happy to make that available to you also. Just visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com, Fill out a media request form and we'll mail that to you or you can call us or write us at the information given at the end of this lesson. Let's turn our attention now to the idea of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord taught that He would come again. And throughout the Bible we see this as a very important idea and teaching of the New Testament. You know, the, new, the second coming is specifically mentioned in the Bible, right? Hebrews 9.27 says, He will come again a second time apart from sin for salvation. I've even heard people say the second coming is not even taught in the Bible. Well, Hebrews 9.27 says, He'll come again a second time. Verses 27 through 28, He'll come again a second time apart from sin, not to save people from sin, but to gather them for salvation. And so when we think about the second coming, let's realize that this was a very important subject to Christians in the first century because there were some major misunderstandings they were facing. Here's the key misunderstanding they had. These Christians in the first century in Thessalonica thought and some were maybe even teaching this idea that the second coming would occur. They, they were saying it's definitely going to occur during their lifetime. And so as a result of that, some of them were just kind of sitting around doing nothing and even being lazy. And Paul would say, hey, you've got to get back to work and live like a Christian. And so uh, thinking that it was going to be immediately was a problem that some of them had uh, during that day and age. Placing a time frame on it, which we cannot do according to the Bible, for Jesus said, No man knows the day nor the hour. Matthew 24, verses 34 through 36. And thus, there was a, a misapplication that went along with that, and it was this. Some of these Christians are thinking to themselves, If some of my loved ones died before the second coming, then they had missed out on the triumph of Christianity, which they saw the second coming as that triumph. And so they're thinking, you know, we're going to be alive and we're going to get to see it happen and we're going to get to celebrate in the victory of Christ because this is going to happen in our lifetime. But then they kind of got sad. They thought that was great, but then they got sad and they thought about, what about Grandpa, who was a Christian too? Did he miss out 
on the ultimate triumph of Christianity? And so Paul is going to say, no, not at all. And he's going to show them how that's all going to work together and that, that, that it may not be an immediate deal, but everybody is going to partake in the ultimate victory when Christ comes again. And so one of the key questions that we want to think about in this study is, and this is what was in the backdrop of these people's mind, what's going to happen to faithful Christians who die before the second coming? Now, it's clear when Christ comes again, we know that would be great. But what's going to happen to our loved ones who didn't live that long? What will happen to me if I die a Christian and the Lord doesn't come back before I die? Have I missed out? Am I missing something? Am I not going to get to participate in that awesome uh, event and that awesome day? And Paul's encouragement is absolutely not. It's going to maybe be a little different for those who are here than those who aren't, but the celebration and the triumphant victory will be the same. And so when we think about this idea, let's realize that there are two extremes concerning the timing of Christ's coming. The first extreme is this. Some Thessalonians were looking for it at any moment, and as a result, they quit their jobs, as it were, and became lazy because of it. And Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 10 following, If a man won't work, neither should he eat. And some of you are in jeopardy of being withdrawn from because of your lazy lifestyle. But then, that was their extreme then. Then there's another extreme today that people have gone to. We're all often on the other extreme where very rarely we think about the immediacy of the Lord's coming. We tend to live without factoring this in at all. By that I mean this. How often does the second coming impact our living for Christ? How often does it come into my mind when I think about things that maybe I should do or things I shouldn't do. When I maybe am tempted to sin and maybe there's some lust of the flesh that is drawing me and pulling on me, do I ever think about to myself that if I got involved in that and the Lord come, how bad that would be for me? And so if we're not careful, we can let either one of those extremes cause us difficulties. And what we need to have is a balanced view. A view that says the Lord could come during my lifetime, Matthew 24, verses 34 through 36, and I'm going to think about it and prepare for it and live like it. And if He doesn't, that's okay too because I've got to live a full life for Christ and I know I will celebrate in the coming of the Lord. And so on this subject, ignorance is definitely not bliss. It may be rampant on the second coming of Christ, but ignorance on this subject will not do Christians any good at all. And that's what Paul will say in 1 Thessalonians 4. Notice verse number 13. The Bible says this. Paul says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. This subject is not one that there needs to be rampant error and ignorance and misinformation on. The second coming of Christ is as clearly taught as any subject in the Bible. And so he says, don't be ignorant on this. Don't, you don't have to worry about those who have fallen asleep as though we're going to sorrow as others have no hope. We have hope and they have hope when it comes to the second coming. And so, what helps with this problem as it relates to Christ's coming? Very simply, a good understanding. The opposite of ignorance is a good understanding of what the Bible teaches. You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. John 8, verse 32. Do not be ignorant, but understand the will of the Lord. Ephesians 5, 17. You can, uh, Jesus said in John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth, your word is truth. And thus, if we study the Scriptures, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, we search them carefully and daily, Acts 17, 11, we won't have to remain in ignorance or buy into some ideas that might cause heartache and heartbreak for us. And so, today, there's also a lot of ignorance on the second coming, and I don't mean that unkindly, but there's a lot of misinformation and ignorance on the second coming of Christ. Some will say that According to Matthew 24, we're going to know it's here when the signs appear. Well, that's not what Matthew 24 is talking about. Jesus said, no man can know the day or the hour. How can you know it's here if no man can know? 
Matthew 24, verse 34 through 36. Some wonder, will it ever happen? And we know it eventually will. Others think it's already happened. But you know, the only thing that matters is, what does the Scripture say? Well, friend, let's talk about, as it relates to 1 Thessalonians 4, some things about uh, what's going to happen when Christ comes and what we can know about that. According to verse 13, the dead in Christ are described as fallen asleep. We do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest we sorrow as others who have not hope. This is not suggesting that death is a state of non-existence, but that it is like a sleep, that it is a peaceful uh, departing from this life and that they are not non-existent but they are in peace. It carries the idea of being restful which we find from Luke 17, a place of rest, Abraham's bosom. It carries the idea of being peaceful without sin and with God, calming, uh, regenerative duration kind of carries the idea of that as well. But then he mentions this, don't, don't, don't realize they're in a place of rest but also they have hope. We don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest we sorrow as others who have no hope. We have hope and they have hope. What hope does the deceased Christian have? Or what do we have? What hope do we have for deceased Christians who have gone on before us? Well, friend, just like us, we know they've been forgiven, right? Acts 2.38, if they've obeyed the gospel, they've been forgiven. If they've walked in the light, they have the blood of Christ. We have the hope they're in paradise, right? Luke chapter 16, verses 9 through 11. We know they're in the constant care of God. Uh, they have victory over the world and sin. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 following, and they have that great reuniting with the faithful of all the ages. And so our hope of the afterlife is based on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, you know, when we think about the hope that we have after death, it's directly connected to Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. In fact, that's what Paul says. Look in verse number 14. Paul says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with Him those who sleep in Jesus. And so yes, we have definite hope based on the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. His death, His burial, His resurrection is proof that the grave is not the end and that people can be with God and be in rest and peace. Now, let's think about this though. What about that coming of the Lord? Are there any events that will transpire that will happen at Christ's coming? Oh yeah, you won't miss out on it. You'll know it's here. You'll know it's going to happen. Look in 1 Thessalonians, you'll know when it's happening. Look in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 15 through 18. Paul says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. We're not going to get ahead of anybody. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. What's going to happen at the coming of Christ? Well, the dead are going to rise, right? Those who are in the grave have hope also because when Christ comes, when the trumpet sounds, when the voice of the archangel is heard, all in the grave will come forth. John 5, verse 28 and 29. And the Lord Himself will descend from heaven, and we will gather up to with Him in the air. And so there are several things that are going to happen all kind of at the same time, as it were. But of the loved ones who've gone on, nobody's going to get ahead of anybody else. And uh, we're all going to get to enjoy and partake in that. And so while the events surrounding Christ's coming are described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, some of the timing of that, as to when it's going to happen is dealt with both in 1 Thessalonians 5 and in another passage in Matthew chapter 24. And so I want to turn your attention to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and notice some things he'll say about the timing of that. Look in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 1. But concerning the times and seasons, again still talking about the second coming, Brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For they say, 
peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But brethren, you're not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. Uh, he'll go on to say we need to be awake, we need to be alert. But think about these two illustrations that he uses here. What do I know about the timing? Well, friend, it's not coming with a RSVP that it's going to be on this day and this time. What we mean by it is this. Paul says it's going to come like a thief in the night. Now, when you think about that illustration, what's it trying to drive home? Suddenly, without warning is the idea. A thief doesn't call you at 9 at night and say, get ready, I'm calling, coming over at 10 till 2 to rob you. When a thief comes, you're surprised. You're caught off guard. You may not be ready. You may not even be where you could do anything about it. And then think about this illustration. This is a vivid one. For every uh, uh, parent, you can especially understand this. It's like labor pangs on a pregnant woman. I can remember times when my wife was pregnant, and we'd be sitting on the couch watching TV, real peaceful, everything's going good. We're sitting on the couch having a good time watching TV, and she would reach over and grab my leg, and I'd say, what's going on? Scary woman, what's going on here? Labor pain just hit her all of a sudden. Well, what's the point? Suddenly, without warning, not something you can say, okay, I'm going to live this way until November the 3rd, 2022. And I'm not predicting today, but just give this an idea. November 3rd, 2022, I've got to, I can live like I want right up to this day. But on this day, I'm going to get ready and everybody's going to go home with God. That's not the way it works. God wants us to be ready always is kind of the idea. Now, is there another passage that helps us with the coming of the Lord? Please hear this passage well. Friend, there are so many people who want to act like and teach and give predictions. Uh, we figured it out. We've put it all together. And you've seen it. I've seen it over the last few years, and you have as well. The Lord's coming on March 15, 2018, some would say, or whatever date. Friend, hear me well today. Anytime somebody says to you a specific day or time, here's what you can do. Put a check mark by their name. They're a false teacher and a liar. How do I know that? Because Jesus told me so. Look in your Bible in Matthew 24, and I want you to look at what the Scripture says in verse 34 through 36. Jesus said of all the things He had currently talked about, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not, no, by no means pass away. Now of that final day, Coming of the Lord, everything coming to pass. But of that day, that was the third question they asked him. But of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Friend, I don't know how to say this any clearer than to say. If anybody says they know when the Lord's coming, they're a liar. How do I know that? Because my Lord said, no one knows. And if nobody knows... And then, friend, I need to let God be true and every man a liar. I don't know. You don't know. Nobody else knows when the Lord's coming. God did not intentionally tell us. What He did tell us is this. What I say unto you, I say unto all, watch and be ready. God didn't tell me when, but He told me something more important. He told me no matter when it is, how to be ready for it. And that's what really matters. Uh, as we think about the second coming, of course, it ought not to catch us off guard. It ought to encourage us to lift up and encourage one another. Uh, we see that it comes with a sense of, of urgency. As we said, verse number 3, it's going to be like uh, a thief in the night or labor pains on a pregnant woman. Uh, there's a sense of urgency. There's a sense in which it is uh, sudden and unexpected. And so what is it that we're trying to really drive home about the Lord's coming? Friend, we need to always be ready. I don't know when it's going to be. I don't know all the details uh, related to the. I don't have perfect knowledge of all of that. Only God does. But I know it'll be sudden. I know it'll be with a sense of unexpectedness. It may not be when we're 100% ready in the sense that, you know, I know it's coming on this day and I've got my bag packed and ready to go kind of idea. Rather, we need to live ready every day. The second coming is something that it ought not to catch us off guard is what the Bible teaches us over and over again. In fact, look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 
And I want you to notice back what Jesus said in this context in verses 4 and 8 uh, about not needing to be caught off guard concerning the second coming. First Thessalonians 5, look beginning in verse 4. Paul says, But you, brethren, you're not in darkness. I've told you this. You're not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You're all sons of light and sons of the day. We're not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, since we're not, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Paul says, and the, the sleep and the day here, he's talking about those who are in ignorance on this subject and those who have seen the light and learned God's truth. We don't have to be in ignorance and darkness on this. Why? Because we have the Scriptures to teach us. And what does it teach us? Don't be caught off guard. Don't let it surprise you. Well, friend, let's think about this then. If I don't know when it's coming and I don't know the day, how is it that, it, that I can't, how is it that I can not be caught off guard by it to live like it might come? That's how. To be prepared for it every day. It's a very simple idea. It, it, how do I make sure that it doesn't catch me off guard and I'm not like, whoa, I wasn't ready for that? Live every day like you're ready for it. That's what Paul's trying to get across here. You Thessalonians have got caught up in a lot of misunderstanding. Don't worry about your loved ones who've gone on before you. Everything's going to be okay with them too. Nobody's going to get ahead of anybody else in the second coming of the Lord. We're all going to get to enjoy it. And also, don't let it catch you off guard. Live every day in view of the second coming. What's that mean? Well, friend, think about this with me. I'm not predicting that it's going to happen, so don't take this the wrong way. But if the Lord did come right now, are you living like it? If the Lord come yesterday, would you have been living like it? The only way to be ready is to get ready. The only way to be ready for the second coming of the Lord is to get ready and to stay ready. And thus, this ought to cause us to encourage and uplift one another. And that's what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Look in verses 9 through 11. Paul says, For God did not appoint us to wrath. God doesn't want anybody to be lost and suffer His wrath but to obtain, obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Does God want anybody to go to hell and suffer His wrath? Of course not. God wants us to be saved. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. God doesn't want anybody to perish, 2 Peter 3 verse 9. And so, no, God doesn't want anybody to suffer His wrath. He wants us to obtain salvation, to be saved. Therefore, we ought not to live in a state of sleepiness, spiritually, stupor, uh, whatever you may want, or you want to, may want to use there, drunkenness. Uh, instead, we want to live faithfully to the Lord each and every day. And so when we think about the coming of Christ, Friend, it's a, a great day of victory. It's a great day of triumph. It's a great day of, of being ready to be with God for all eternity. Just imagine one day Jesus is going to come. That, that great shout, that voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God is going to be played and all men everywhere will hear His voice. Those who have done good will go to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. If I'm alive when that happens, what needs to be my main focus? Friends, so many people want to focus on when it's going to be. Please don't misunderstand me, but in the grand scheme of things, the when is not the major thing I need to be worried about. The major thing I need to be worried about is how, not the when. But how am I living every day? Instead of getting caught up thinking about when's the Lord coming back? Is it going to be today? Is it going to be tomorrow? Is it going to be 10 years from now? Let's kind of push that aside for just a second. And instead, let's focus on how we're living. And you know what? If I stay focused on how I'm living, 
let him come. If I'm living like I ought to be living, if I'm living every day for the Lord, and I'm trying to do the best I can, and I'm trying to walk in the light, I'm ready for it no matter when it may be. And that's the emphasis Scripture places on us. Could it be in my lifetime? Sure. Could it be a thousand years after my lifetime? Absolutely. It's not the when that's important. It's how we're living that God and the Apostle Paul and Jesus Christ are trying to drive home to these Christians. And so let's think about our own lives today in view of the second coming of Christ. We know He's going to come. There's no doubt about that. Are you ready for it? You say, ready? How? How do I get ready? My well, friend, if you're not a Christian, here's how you get ready. You've got to believe Jesus is the Son of God. In John 8, verse 24, Jesus said, Unless you believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins. Having believed in Christ, you must do what the Thessalonians did and turn from sin to God in repentance. 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 9 and 10. You've got to make the good confession. I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Acts chapter 8, verse 36 through 38. And then to be in Christ, to be ready for His coming, to be a child of God, you must be immersed in water. Galatians 3, 27 says, As many of us as were baptized into Christ have clothed themselves with Christ. I want to be in Christ when He comes, and I get in Christ by being baptized into Christ. And then, of course, we want to rise out of that watery grave, Romans 6, 1 through 4, to walk in newness of life, meaning that to be ready if the Lord comes, when He comes, I, I want to live every day as though He's coming. I want to live every day in view of His coming. I want to walk in the light, 1 John 1, verse 7 through 10. I want to be a good example, Matthew 5, 16. And I want to do my best to give myself every day to the cause of Christ, Luke 9, 23. And friend, I promise you this, if you'll obey the gospel, and you'll live for the Lord to the best of your ability every day. The when's not as important. It's the how that we focus on. And so we want to encourage you today to make sure that we're ready and to live our lives in it every day in view of Christ's coming. And let's rejoice for one day the Lord is coming back. And if I live faithful, I can live with Him forever. May God bless us as we study His Word together. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go. Gospel of Christ.